Okay. This is Financing Social Enterprise in the Very Long Run. Uh, we're looking at churches and giving, and we're looking at uh, the variables that will impact their giving. We're going to look at religious cost and secular cost. We'll get into that later. And we're going to look at uh, charitable donations at the margin, essentially. Both. We're going to look at topology of financing collectible goods. Um, this is the idea of trying to um, trying to look at the free rider aspect of public goods and how you have a public good that everybody gets but not a lot of people want to pay for. Street lamps is a great example of that because street lamps is a public access, but if people don't want to pay for them, they're still going to reap the benefits of the street lamps. Social entrepreneurship also has the same thing. Public safety, growth poverty, environmental conditions, and better education opportunities, same thing. People want these benefits, but others aren't willing to pay for them, but they still reap the reward of it. Um, and we're gonna look at three methods. Um, the first of which is government provisions. Um, and this is how you get around the free riders. And, and we're gonna look at what can you put into place? Government provisions is receiving directly from the government. Essentially um, a tax. Yeah, a tax, a tax or stipend collected that sets up this government and sets up a payment system for the public good. And then there's also private agencies that do the same thing. Parks, healthcare, education. Yeah. Uh, Financing public goods from residual profits. Um, Consumers pay premiums in order to make the donations. Tom's is a great example of this. Um, they have people pay a premium price knowing that their donations are going to go towards a public good or public uh, service such as giving shoes away in this case and fair trade coffee doing the exact same thing. Um, there's also indirectly um, for the diversion or residual profits and this can be anything from either Walmart or Coca-Cola doing their clean water and helping through this cleanup act. Um, and then finally, our, the third of the three, um, voluntary contributions. And this is, as it says, volunteers contributing their time, money, resources, labor, and a lot of times this is tax incentive. Um, it can be just volunteer out of goodwill, but most of the time it's out of tax incentives, um, which is a huge drive behind the thing, whole thing. Uh, it's very, very limited just because you're relying on the donations of certain people. But again, it's the third of the three. And then one more, what we're going to be looking at during the time is the club model. Um, this is the idea that people can pay a membership for a club that is, that is voluntary, thus benefits the membership and must exceed the cost of membership. Both, both the benefits of the club membership vary with club sizes. We'll look at that next. Um, and go, can go to the next slide. Uh, models is can include country clubs, health clubs, homeowners associations, um, and the, and sororities. Yeah, fraternities and sororities. The biggest key is um, the, the payments that set it apart. This is how a membership starts. You have to have the payment to set them apart from the public goods or the private industries. Um, and the fewer, and so a few things that affect this are the fewer members, the higher the cost, the more members are overuse. But at the same time, the more engaged members you have, the higher the value, and the less engaged members you have, the less the value. Um, we're gonna look at churches as a kind of an example of a social enterprise. Uh, it's a great, uh, great example to look at because it's the exact, exact definition uh, most of the time of certain denominations that match up with the social enterprise. Um, churches, 
most of the time have a very extensive, very long record of costs that go along with the church that date back to well before times that we know. Uh, churches have the same problem. They must finance collectively output while mitigating free riding, free riding amongst its constituents. As the church grows denser, there's more of a chance of having free riders. So they want to increase the output while decreasing the free riders. Uh, we're going to look at the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a very large convention. Um, and Southern Baptist goes back to all the way back to Reformation. And it has, this is one of those churches that I just mentioned has an extensive list of, of costs and balances um, and money flowing through the church. And that's why it's a good example to look at. It has tons of smaller independent um, governing churches under it. And uh, one thing we're going to look at is missionaries and the non-rival, non-exclusible, zero value to other SBC, which is a great and accurate example that we can use for free riders. Um, just adding no value to the outside public. Um, we're gonna, they are um, benefited or they're funded in two different areas. The Lottie Moon Christmas Offering, which started back in the 1800s, was a lot named after a missionary who started this fund and this offering to get missionaries more money so that they can go to different far out places. Uh, and then the second one we'll be looking more in depth is cooperative program. And this is the board essentially getting together and deciding where to allocate the money, allocate funds, whether that is in different areas of the church or that is towards the missionaries. And it's, a, and it's again the board that decides on that. And so our, our data comes from, one, the cooperative program, which has funding for the international missionaries that dates all the way back to 1925. Um, we have measurements um, every five years all the way to from 1935. And these are typically organized by state, but we also have uh, other regions, such as the Northeast and the Northwest, where there's not as many Southern Baptist Convention churches um, that we look at as well. Uh, contributions to the club good. Variables of interest, again, that we're looking at are the cooperative program and the lottery room offerings. And these have some distinct differences and we'll acknowledge and look at those as well. But these contributions have largely stagnated since around 1990, just for a little history. Um, we see all of them gradually increase from 1935 all the way until 1990. But again, we haven't seen uh, much growth since then. Uh, these are structured by U.S. state conventions and within conventions over time. So we have differences between states um, at any given period of time, cross-sectional data. And then we also have conventions over time. So we can look at um, Alabama from 1935, 1940, 1945, all the way till today. And again, the state data, um, more on this, the variables, just a few of the variables that we have. Uh, available to look at is the number of churches, government transfer payments, uh, such as Social Security, per capita income race, and several others. And these, again, are all from 1935 to 2015. Uh, religion, religious exclusion cost. Uh, this is the impact of exclusion mechanisms in order to promote contributions uh, to the club good. Uh, the opportunity cost of adherence, availability of the sex. sex. Um, and the SBC density metric, low concentration of SBC churches, implies lower cost alternatives to SBC membership. So what we're looking at here is religious cost increases when we have um, more availability to give in other areas. The opportunity cost increases um, when we have more avenues to give, which makes sense. If we only have one church uh, in a given area, then we have a very low opportunity cost. Um, and low religious costs as well. So we want to think of a monopoly of churches as sort of a, a, a very low cost relative to a high proportion of churches. Yeah. Um, and the secular exclusion costs we look at uh, very much the same way. We see competition against secular alternatives. Um, this, except this, we look at a little bit differently. Um, we examine the repeal of blue laws by state 
to examine opportunity costs of religious participation. Um, what we mean by this is, as we see blue laws be repealed, um, in other words, very strict um, moral codes that are repealed, now we have more opportunities to give in more secular ways, um, as opposed to just through the church. So again, as we see the opportunity cost increases as we see more and more and more avenues to give. Uh, and here's the model that we'll set up, the empirical model and hypothesis. We're going to test the club model of public good financing on the mitigation of free riding. Um, we're going to test four dependent variables. Um, we're going to look at per church giving and total giving, um, both to CP and the Lottie Moon um, charities. Um, these religious costs are lowest when dominated by a single religious provider and vice versa. Um, secular cost increases with the repeal of blue laws. Again, just want to make sure we get straight. Um, the religious cost would be very high when we have, um, again, many different avenues to give and vice versa. Good. Um, so hypothesis one and two, which is per church contributions will increase with religious cost. Uh, for collective religions, and then we make a distinction between these collective religions and um, private religions. Um, again, in this case, Southern Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention can be considered a collective religion because it is exclusive, um, and the lifestyle is costly because of these moral codes. Um, drinking, no drinking, the absence of um, gambling, and no sex outside of marriage, and these things uh, make it exclusive, um, which is why we examine it as a collective religion. <coughs> Excuse me. So as church competition increases, uh, religious cost also increases, and church density decreases. So church density, um, which is defined as the number of Southern Baptist Commission churches over the total population. Um, so when we see church density decrease, we see competition increase and religious cost increase. Yeah. Um, I thought three and four, per church contributions to uh, the cooperative program or lighting in will increase with secular cost. Secular competition um, is just as important in religious markets. Um, again, we see the free rider problem in the same way, and higher cost increases per church contributions. So when we see um, a high secular cost, meaning we have more avenues to give um, in secular ways due to the repeal of blue laws, we see a increase um, in a secular cost, and therefore we actually see more or higher per church contributions. Okay. Uh, total contributions to the Quaker program or Lottie Moon will decrease with religious cost. Uh, again, we're looking at the same thing except the opposite. Um, increasing exclusion will reduce total contributions. A large number of potential members are excluded. And this is assuming that price elasticity is very high. So again, this is the opposite of hypothesis one and two. And uh, we will look at this um, in the results. Okay? Uh, contributions to uh, the quality program and Lottie Moon will increase with secular cost. Again, this is the same test, um, both secular cost instead of religious cost. And let's look at the results. Oh, one more hypothesis. Um, and this is just talking about the difference between the cooperative program and Lottie Moon. We would expect that um, the impact of religious and secular cost will be more for Lottie Moon, as it is traditional and anonymous, than the cooperative program, which will be a, or should be, a more stable source of financing relative to Lottie Moon. Um, when we see the results, we'll actually see that we see something different and don't totally have an explanation for this yet. Um, so, results for hypothesis one and two. When church density is reduced, the contributions increase, which is which is consistent with hypothesis one. We see this by about hundred dollars per person. Um, the effect of increasing state population on the average contribution also increases. So again, the reason the way we test this is we see an additional ten thousand people to a state population, holding the number of churches constant. Um, therefore, we're changing the church density, and then we can we were able to see this result very clearly. Okay. Uh, hypothesis three and four: secular costs increase per church contributions also increase. Um, so we see an increase in contributions with a blue law repeal. Um, again, so we see um, these moral codes begin to diminish over time, and we see an increase in contributions. 
um, due to this high opportunity cost of secular costs. Okay? Um, results related to Apollo 5 and 6, increasing religious exclusion lowers total contributions, uh, but not by much. Increases in church and per church giving are offset by declining total giving with secular cost. Okay. Um, contributions to the cooperative program are more responsive to change in religious cost than lighting mode. This is not supportive of Apostles 5, and the impact of secular cost is more pronounced for the cooperative program, which is counterintuitive. We don't totally have an explanation um, for this as of yet. So I'll conclude by saying uh, financial production and free riding is optimal by the constituents um, and the social entrepreneurship may attempt to charge a premium markup linked to their public goods or the social entrepreneur enterprise may choose to lower their price perhaps to zero to maximize the reach of their product. Um, examining religious organizations is a good insight on how club theory may work such as um, SBC which we looked at um, through the Wanting Moon or the cooperative. Uh, individual incentives to free ride combined with cooperative pre competitive pressures Whittle away a firm's ability to divert resources to finance the club good. And then finally, raising the cost of the membership could lead to more suitable productions as the analysts of the SBC. Um, and more involved members could also uh, lead to the production of the analysts of the SBC. Um, thank you for listening.